Ladies and gentlemen, let's take a moment to talk about film. Let's take a moment to think about how it's revolutionized our society and transformed it into the one we recognize today. Films can make us laugh and films can make us cry. Films take us to faraway planets or bloodied battlefields or Mordor. And where would, the, where would these films come from without the vision of the, and the mastery of the filmmaker behind it? Throughout movie history, some of the greatest names come to mind. Alfred Hitchcock, Stanley Kubrick, Ethan and Joel Cohen, Sam Raimi, Catherine Bigelow, every last one of these individuals has left their distinctive mark on society, and they should be greatly commended for it. However, one name stands above the rest. One name that is recognized globally, one name that represents some of the greatest films that have ever been made. This name, ladies and gentlemen, is Oliver Stone. Whether you've seen Platoon or Wall Street or JFK, you can begin to understand how much influence this man has had on us. Did you know that through the film JFK, Oliver Stone successfully convinced the United States government to reopen the Kennedy assassination case? That's right, through this one film, the entire integrity of the United States government was revolutionized. This just goes to show how one filmmaker's vision can impact us all. So now, Without any further ado, it is my honor to welcome Mr. Oliver Stone. for a few years now, uh, I don't know what's on your minds, and I think it would be a better, uh, rather than to me, to make some kind of flat statement about my, yeah, my, my feelings or beliefs or opinions, which you've seen in the movies, and it's a bit all over the place, as you know. I'd rather answer your questions, because then I can see what's on your minds, and, I, and we can cut to the chase. So uh, I'm not going to say anything except thank you for having me, and uh, Mr. Sullivan. Very happy to be here, and I'm representing the International Peace Foundation, which is, uh, I hope you know what they are. They've sent many Nobel Prize winners, scientists all over Asia in the last six, seven years, and all before that in Europe, and they've done a wonderful job of promoting the concept among students of going out of the world and doing something positive rather than just, just making money which is the theme of my last film, Wall Street, which I just finished a month ago, and which we're now editing. <clears throat> so on that note, let me uh, open it up for questions from both students and faculty. Please uh, come ahead. Who's the first one to take uh, a shot? You. <laughs> You're very spoken. Okay. Um, well, over the years, you made a lot of films that have had an impact on on the globe, you know, films like Platoon that really opened our eyes to uh, you know, issues around the world. Um, are you thinking of making any movies that have to do with the promotion of peace throughout the world? Like <coughs> I would like to think the movie uh, speaks. The movies have been about peace. Uh, I don't think you set out to do a doc, you know, a uh, a movie about peace. I don't think you're going to do that at the box office because there's a lack of tension in peace. If you notice, uh, uh, except for perhaps in comedy. Uh, even that, even comedy is based on some degree of violence and some degree of tension. So, uh, you know, the best way to approach uh, a high-flown abstract like peace is through struggle and often through, uh, through violence and war. Because only can you, then can you appreciate peace. You know, the blue day only, and the sun only mean anything if you've seen the rain and the storm and, and the clouds. So contrast is what makes peace. But peace is not really, uh, you know, I think when you say it like that, it feels like an abstract terminology. There is no such thing. We all, you all have come from families, and inside your families, there's 
obviously d dissension, uh, fights, uh, you have brothers, sisters, parents, you have children, and you're going to find that dissension is the nature of life. We're born <coughs> in a rather violent process called birth, and we're dying in what is apparently a very painful process, can be a painful process with d disease and illness, and, and death itself is a challenge. So uh, don't kid yourselves. Peace is, is uh, part of the life experience. It's not the only goal of life. It's to live. I frankly believe, I think the goal, uh, the purpose is to really learn to coexist with your own existence. And uh, that's, a, that's a lot of work. It may not sound like a very ambitious uh, Thing. But when you get older, you might settle that for less uh, higher standard and just try to get along with yourself, understand yourself, feel yourself, know yourself, and do good things with that knowledge. Try not to do harm in your life. And this is what I've tried, although I was a soldier at one point in, in Vietnam, as some of you know. And, uh, but I did learn from a negative experience, and many of you are going to have challenges in your life, very negative challenges. Some of you are going to have severe negative challenges, and I hope that you will appreciate them because they're not bad. It's the nature of life is suffering, and it's going to come to you, and out of that will grow a dynamic that will be, you will be a stronger person with more character, and you're able to project, I hope, a sense of well-being and peace to other people. That's peace, to coexist with your own existence. And as uh, Robert Louis Stevenson once said, I am to unravel, not to cut the Gordian knot of life, but to unravel it smilingly. Um, Mr. Stone, you made a few movies about the war in Vietnam. Would you say that's been a cathartic experience for you, making those films? A what experience? A cathartic experience. Cathartic, yes. By the way, uh, do you understand my, am I talking too fast for some, uh, I don't know how about your degree of English is. is it, should I slow down? Or, no. Uh, most, you're all very proficient in English? Okay. I don't want to talk, I don't want to talk over your heads and I don't want to talk under your heads, so I'm trying to find a, a level. Uh, as to cathartic, which is a Greek term, catharsis, uh, release from suffering, life is catharsis every day. Have a, we were talking about this last night in the Peace Foundation, what resurrection is. And resurrection is a Christian term. Uh, rebirth is a Buddhist term, and so forth and so on. But it doesn't, it, there's all these uh, metaphoric analogies in every religion in the world. Uh, but uh, the truth is that it happens, I believe, I believe, every day. I think that we, every day you wake up, it's like waking up again from the dream and going back into this so-called reality, convention, call it conventional reality, as opposed to ultimate reality, call it conventional reality where there are the illusions of school, physicalities, buildings, and so forth, and that we deal in that world. We have to. So how do you do it? You do it. Every day is a challenge. Every day, I do believe, uh, those of you who are aware, who uh, are awake, are going to meet your edge. Uh, I don't know if you know that expression, but it's an American expression, meet your edge, means to come across something that will, not a big thing, a little thing, that will piss you off. I mean, really, you, know, you may get up in the morning and your brother wakes you up and you just are in a lousy mood and you just tell him to go when you go and tell him to do something that you don't mean or you try to yell at him or you want to use the bathroom first and he does, he's in the bathroom. You know, you can always find a, a hundred reasons to erupt. Every moment is a challenge in that sense how you treat your parents, how you go about your homework, how you come to school, how you, when you see your classmates, I'm sure some of you have friction among yourselves every day. It's the nature of this existence. You have gossip. I hate gossip personally, I was in school too. And gossip is the one, one of the horrible things about school because it's generally untrue. That's really the truth. And it, you'll find as you get older that there's more and more gossip. It doesn't go away, you know, you'd like it to go away. Uh, there's all kinds of tension, competition, conflict, and that is the nature of rebirth. You have to deal with it. And, the, the, and what I was saying before about smiling about it is really the key is that, you know, you, I mean, all of us get upset every day. Not every day, but some of us get more upset than others. And when anger doesn't get you anywhere, unfortunately, nor does, uh, nor does egoism. 
egoism, I, by that I mean uh, putting yourself at the center of things all the time. An exaggerated sense of self-centeredness will do you, will be difficult for you to live this life. And many people have it. This, this is the conflict of life. It's, these are the basic things. They're nothing dramatic like wars and uh, the uh, issues of uh, disease. Sometimes it's just the everyday aggressions that you feel, the angers. And I think that's the beginning of what this gentleman called peace. Peace is every step. Peace is every step. Uh, and you have to earn peace. It doesn't come. Uh, we hope that our leaders don't take us to war because unfortunately in America we've been, since, my, since I was born, we've been in seven or eight wars, you know. We're, we love wars in America. It's, uh, it's good for the economy. It's apparently good for the economy. There's a lot of armed merchants and merchants of death that sell weapons to the government for enormous amounts of money and they are encouraged to fight wars and to find enemies and create enemies if there's no enemies out there. So those are big things, and leaders are there, and they're going to be there the rest of your life, and they're going to be dangerous to you, or they can be helpful to you. And you might feel frustrated and say, hey, I can't do anything about it. You know, they're, I'm just a little fly here. I can make movies, maybe, or try to do something that fights for a more sane approach to existence. But let's say uh, you have that struggle on your hands. I would suggest, you know, like, start with yourself. Look in the mirror. And think about yourself. If everybody on the, on the planet is crazy and going to war, uh, look inside the mirror and try to see the aggression in yourself and see how you behave. And I think, honestly, I really believe there is a, a, a flow from our actions. And I think that when you behave better, the people around you will behave better and higher with a higher purpose and a higher standard. And I think that radiates outward. And I think, ultimately, the leaders lose their power if they're preaching a standard that is below that. And I think that's the way we can affect the world in our own little way. We can put out a good feeling of peace. Catharsis. Um, I have two questions. First one, Dan. What, uh, what started you off in the movie making business? In what? The movie making business. Ah. Uh, what started me off uh, was I was always interested in storytelling. My dad always uh, told me great stories when I was a kid. And my mom was an avid moviegoer when I was a child and I would, used to skip school. And she'd make me skip school and take me to, and she wanted me to go to the movies with her when I was a kid. I always liked the movies and I also loved reading and getting away, escaping from the fears of life. The, and there was fantasy life in the movies and in books. And in drama, I would go to the plays. But I, I, I never thought I could do it myself uh, until about uh, the age of 19, I wrote a book, a novel, which never got published. It was a long novel, about 1,200 pages. And it was about me. <laughs> Talk about exaggerated self-importance, but I certainly had it at the age of 19. But I was troubled and I had a lot of uh, conflicts and a lot of anger and a lot of misunderstanding. Didn't understand things and I had to put it on paper because I, I really, I guess I couldn't find anybody I could talk to about it. So I put it on paper and it became a, uh, a, a, an unpublished uh, manuscript, which uh, took me to a place, another place. It didn't get published, but my life changed radically and I went off to uh, uh, Vietnam uh, twice in the 1960s. And I changed, my and it was Southeast Asia, where, which really changed my life. Uh, gave me a new understanding of life. I came back, uh, make a long story short, I mean I spent th off and on three years out here in Southeast Asia and I came to Cambodia back in 1965, it was before the war and it was uh, quite, a, quite a beautiful city. And uh, when I got back to America after the wars, uh, I ended up at, with, a, with, with the GI Bill which was paid for by the government at the New York University Film School in uh, 1969. And frankly, uh, I was able to take the desire to write the books and put it into a new medium, transform it into a love of still telling stories but using a camera instead of, the, instead of a pen. But I never, f I, I, and I would counsel you uh, though, and caution you, that I always had the respect for writing and I kept writing, 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 even in film school. I kept writing screenplays because I really believed the power, uh, the original, the origination of a movie was in the screenplay. 
And I know a lot of students with me at that time felt that get rid of the script, take the camera, and improvise and create a world. Now that can work to some degree, but I really do believe still fundamentally in the script of the screenplay, which is like a play, which creates characters on paper, which don't necessarily resemble what you finish with, but it's certainly a start point. Got out of film school, struggled for many years, many rejections, many scripts, and eventually got a few breaks when I was in my later 20s. I have a picture with my English teacher. Because she said, did she give me good grades if I do this? Yeah, thanks. Well, I don't know. Okay. Later, then. Thank you. Is it true that you are making a film about Hitler? No, I don't know. These rumors get around. No, actually, I'm doing a film called uh, The Secret History of the United States, which is a 10-hour documentary, which is coming out later this year. I've been working on it for uh, three years with two historians. Uh, I'm trying to dramatize a very complicated subject, and which is the uh, how America became a national security state. It goes, it goes up to now, and it goes back to 1900. And we tell the story in a way that's quite different. It's not done in a typical uh, textbook, uh, linear fashion. We go back and we try to find the patterns of history, the reasons why things are cause and effect, cause and effect, very important concept. Uh, and uh, part of the, one of the characters in the story from the 20th century, of course, is Hitler. It's a very important character. And we go into the causes and effects of that century and of Hitler and what Hitler represented. You know him as a great character. Hitler sounds like a, the one character. But history is not determined by individuals. It's determined by forces, cause and effect. Hitler is a monster, but he's the product of a, of a set of conditions in Germany that were allowed him to take power, abuse power, seduce allies such as the United States and England to support him with uh, his system and to, uh, to, to because there's, I don't want to go into all the reasons, but this is complicated stuff, but uh, Hitler is only a character in history. And I think uh, we have to look at this whole thing from 19, uh, the 20th century to now. We have to look at it very in more depth and look at the patterns. For example, some of you may know of World War II but none of you seem to know that much about World War I, which is crucial to understanding World War II. The causes of World War II are very much rooted in World War I. And what are the causes of World War I? This is where we have to, I believe we have to start our story. So you look at the uh, 10 hours, and hopefully uh, you'll see new patterns. That you, the facts are the same, but the patterns uh, may be different. It may be understandable to you through different patterns. Very important you understand this. History is subject to interpretation. And I hope to be able to interpret it with my colleagues in a way that is fresh and original and exciting. Hi, have you ever portrayed your own personality through one of your characters in your I can't hear you, sir. Have you ever portrayed your own personality through one of the characters in your movies? Uh, to some degree, yes. I think that I was uh, in Platoon as uh, the Charlie Sheen uh, character, sort of was y a young me. I would say uh, there was a lot of similarities, but I put him in Wall Street, uh, and I often would be a piece of the protagonist. I'm a piece of Jim Morrison. I was a piece of Richard Nixon. I was a piece of Jim Garrison in JFK. I can't go so far as to say I felt like George Bush in W, but, uh, because I really don't feel, I think I feel in so many ways the opposite of him he was in my generation. But you never know. I don't think, I would never deceive myself to think that there is a piece of me in everybody that I do. And Alexander, the uh, of Macedon, I think was a wonderful character. His relationship to his parents fascinates me. Uh, so yes, a piece of me is often there. I would not talk radio though. I don't think. Or in another film called World Trade Center, which was in 2006, because it was a story, a, a very accurate story uh, told by uh, two, the two, there were 20 survivors in the uh, building 9 11, and those two guys, uh, the firefighter, uh, uh, the Port Authority uh, uh, policemen, 
lived that story, and uh, they, I represented it as accurately as I could. So I, I was less, less, less in there as a person. Um, where do you get your inspirations, you know, um, for making the movies that you make, creating them at least? Like, well, the inspiration of... comes and goes, you know. I mean, you have to, it's a lot of work, but, you know, I mean, you have to let the years go by and each, you know, like, don't make a plan for next year. I mean, make a plan for this year. Make a plan for today. Make a plan for tomorrow. Try to feel your life as you're leaving it. And that's my best feeling. For, I mean, things change. You know, you, you think, uh, when I was younger, I would draw up a list and say, these are the ten movies I want to make. Uh, and, uh, I only made one of those ten. But that was actually Alexander. I made that when I wanted to make that movie when I was young. So, you have to uh, live it as you, uh, you learn from each movie. It's a process, it's an evolution, I said before. So, you grow, your, your interests will change. And, uh, learn from around you, talk, you know, I think it comes in the air. There's, all, there's often an issue, for example, the George Bush people was bothering me. I, for me, it was the worst decade of my life uh, under his leadership in America, and I thought it was a very, very uh, strange time. It felt very strange indeed, and I thought, I must respond to this. I have strong feelings about George Bush, why he got here, how he got here, who is he, and I wanted to put that on film. So that grew out of that time period, whereas Wall Street grew out of an earlier thing with my father. My father was a Wall Street broker. So I, at the age of 40, uh, I, just, I wanted to go back and be in his shoes a bit and feel what it was like to, to be a, a Wall Street broker, which I had never been. So the, these kinds of things. And here in Thailand, I did, uh, next uh, south of you, in Thailand, uh, west of you, in Thailand is uh, the story of Hays uh, Lely Hayslip, which I did. And I hope some of you can get a chance to see that because it's a Buddhist-oriented uh, film. Leili wrote a book called When Heaven and Earth Change Places about her life. She had been a, a farm girl, peasant girl in, uh, in, North, in South Vietnam and been involved with both sides, the, uh, both enemies, and gone through an enormous amount of suffering. Married uh, an American uh, contractor, went to America, lived in America and had a tremendous life in America, ups and downs, as she did in Vietnam. So at the end of the book, there's a tremendous wisdom in her. She goes back and forth now between Vietnam and America, bridging two cultures. And I think it's one of my favorite movies. And unfortunately, it was never successful in America because there was not that much interest in an Asian heroine. But I'm glad I made the movie. Please see it, Heaven and Earth, 1994. Oh, you did? Did you like it? Oh, good. <laughs> If you were to uh, shoot a movie in Cambodia, which issue do you think you target? Oh boy. <laughs> Cambodia is an uh, incredible story, as you know. Uh, probably, you know, the big issue of where uh, this society went. But, you know, I think Killing Fields, at least from my perspective, would did a fascinating job of revealing so much. Uh, not the whole story, obviously, but a lot. And uh, Hang Noor, I, I worked with Dr. Hang Noor on Heaven and Earth. He was in the movie. And of course, he was very uh, embittered by the experience and suffered greatly from it. It's, uh, you know, but it, it reminds me to some degree of the Holocaust in, in, uh, in uh, Europe, because my mother was French, and I remember when the French, uh, after the war, I was in Paris, and uh, the French, everybody was telling me, uh, well, not everybody, but a lot of people were always telling me of how they resisted the Germans, you know. But as time went on, yeah, and the more and more facts came out, I realized that most French people had collaborated with the Germans, or at least coexisted with them, because few people want to take on the Germans. I mean, they're very serious people, the Germans, so they will find you, police you, torture you. I'm not saying they're, you know, but that was, they were very good occupiers and very efficient people, very efficient war machine and occupiers. So it's very dangerous, and it's very scary, very scary. And I can understand why the French people were not more resistant. I can understand that. As you know, half of France divided the Vichy regime. So it's a, you know, these, these kinds of issues are really interesting, societal coercion. I've always been interested in conformity, because I grew up conformist. We were taught in school, you had, you know, this was the way the world was. America was the good guy, communism was the bad guy. There's a world conspiracy to get us. We have to go out there and we have to fight off the communists who are winning 
by the way, or winning the world. This was always ingrained in us at our early age. The same way the Khmer Rouge ingrained their philosophy into uh, the young people of that time, that their parents may have been bad or evil and had to be eliminated. This is an amazing story, great story. Uh, what advice would you have for an aspiring filmmaker? Well, I would answer that line, uh, that question along the lines I said to, to the young lady about inspiration, because I think it's very much, you have to be inspired and you have to be passionate, otherwise don't go. It's a very high risk, uh, long shot field. Uh, so many young people now have fallen in love with the medium uh, because of the, and also because of the uh, more accessible technology are able to make movies at a lower price, uh, much less cost and aggravation, but it becomes also a lure like drugs and you end up doing stuff that don't, nobody wants to see and that can all, you know, you have to test yourself and you have to be disciplined about this, you know. Remember what I said earlier about a story. Learn to tell a story. Learn the dramatic principles if you can. I, I uh, read books, lots of movies, read screenplays. I also went to classes in screenwriting at NYU. I went to acting school. I went to uh, several acting schools, in fact. Uh, to learn the process of directing, I, you know, it took, I did th three sh very short films and then three not so short films. So uh, out of that six, one was successful to me. But I learned from mistakes. But it was a, it's a lot you need to have to walk before you can run. And uh, I would urge you to be humble about that. I really do. Uh, and learn to work with people. There's so many uh, forms of uh, discipline required. I mean, it's, it is acting. It's writing. But they don't necessarily blend. They can blend. But how do you put something on paper that somebody can act and will do something good with? It's mise-en-scene which means the staging, which is very misunderstood. The staging is always underrated. Uh, people, when they see a good movie, they don't think about the staging. But somebody had to decide, well, you stand there, you stand there, you do this, you do that. That's not very, it's all assumed, you, you know, it, you, people think that's natural, it's not. Because you're dealing with a flat frame, and you're dealing with a set. And how do you make that set uh, three-dimensional or four-dimensional? It's very, very important. So these issues have to be thought about, and. I do believe it takes a certain amount of experience to build to. I don't, you know, there's so many films out there now that I really, but I find my appetite to see them is less uh, because they're subject matter that I don't really particularly care about. I think the, what I grew up with, and perhaps you didn't, is movies were movies. They were spectacular, they were something bigger than life, and I loved that idea of, see, of getting away. Movies, as they become more into this era, have become more and more realistic more and more about me and my pet parrot, my goldfish, my you know, simple stories. And I suppose that's a good way to start, but I think that's where you should start. I don't think it's where you should end. Uh, make movies, I think, that other people want to see, and you'll do better, which means go back to the art of storytelling, tell a good story, and remember, stories have suspense, even though stories are about peace and all that good stuff. Make a story about peace, make sure it has suspense, which means you need tension, which means you need some opposing uh, forces or energies against, that work against peace. Um, you, uh, your films give out a, a message, um, usually a political message, if I, if I may say so, and also express your political views on things. And you had a while back you made the film Wall Street and the upcoming one Wall Street 2, am I right? Okay, um, <laughs> what message do you intend to give with this one, with the upcoming one, <laughs> if uh, it's not too much time? I don't have a message written on my back. <laughs> <laughs> Try not to do that. Uh, please, I mean, if I'm going to do that, I might as well make a documentary about Wall Street. No, the, the message is something that evolves. This is what inspiration is about. You make a film. You write it, you uh, co-write it, you direct it, you edit it, you you spend time with that film, you co-inhabit the world with that film. That's your partner for a year. This is not a process of, hey, if I had a message, I'd write it down. You know, here, why do I have to make the film? Write an essay, make a documentary. A film is something else. It grows, it really does. It becomes its own life. If it's a good film, it has its, it breathes of itself. It's, it is 
a chemical uh, experiment that, that becomes synthetic, it synthesizes into something else. So therefore, you know, the message itself, whatever you, the theme, I call it the theme, changes. The theme might be when you started, I, listen, I want to do a movie about greed, and the, that's your theme. But, you know, and you think about all the forms of greed, you write this thing called Wall Street. But by the end of the movie, you'll see that the guy who practices the greed uh, is also a human being, and he has his altruistic moments. You know what altruistic means, let's say unselfish moments. So there's all kinds of gray ambiguity that creeps into these issues. That's what makes the ball game. That's what makes people interested. If they go to the movie and they know who the bad guy is and who the good guy is, most people kind of like, you know, unless it's really well done, they get, it's predictable, they've seen it a hundred times, they get bored. So the idea is, I think the more interesting movies are a guy starts here, a girl starts here, and you think that's that, but it's not that, and then it becomes this, you see. That's tension, it's surprise, it's reversal. These are some of the issues. So avoid messages and stick to deep themes and try to develop your theme and your understanding of that theme. Um, I, I can't uh, uh, avoid messages, avoid messages. And I don't regard my films as political, you do, but that's the way you see them. But if you can, per uh, if you can uh, deflect or change your perception and look at the films again and look at them and say, hey, maybe these films are not about uh, politics. Maybe this is really about love. This is really about the search for meaning. Maybe this is a character who's really looking for his purpose in life. Then you can see the films in a whole different way. So you're limiting yourself by saying uh, politics or conspiracy. You're limiting the theme. It's up to you to make it. It's the way you receive a movie that will determine how you make a movie. Discover all the different things. Or... Yeah, uh, she asked where I got all the research in JFK. This was a very uh, long process. It was about more than a year. We read everything. I had a co-writer, Zach Clark. We read more than uh, we read everything that was available on the assassination, pro and con. We also talked to about 50, 50, 60 people who've been involved in the case including many of the witnesses at Dealey Plaza that day. We, I think as much as far as anything goes, we, right now in this world, we're probably, we've seen, uh, I probably talked to as many people uh, as, as anybody else who's been involved in the Kennedy assassination. And I have to say, uh, it's an indeterminate case because it's a tricky thing and I can't tell you everything I know now because a lot of the stuff I learned after the fact, from the f when the film came out, a lot of people contacted me with different uh, versions and also more depth. But listen, uh, the film uh, is based on reading a huge amount of material and trying to get it down to three hours and nine minutes. That's what the film is, three hours and nine minutes. So we're taking uh, the stories of 20 people and making them into three or five, you see. So that's where the condensation has to happen. But, uh, we, we believe very strongly that there was obviously not one gunman. And we tried, the hard part of that movie was how to take all this research, which is mind deadening, and make it exciting, make it into a story. And actually, we ended up doing a very strange thing for a movie, we, and it's complex. We ended up taking four stories and blending them one into, into grafting one into the other. One is the story of Jim Garrison, who is the prosecutor, true story in New Orleans. And the other one is a story of uh, Dealey, uh, the other one is a story of. Uh, uh, Lee Harvey Oswald, which is an amazing story unto itself. We blend that in. And then the third story is a story that happened in Washington, D.C., where we meet this character called X, based on Fletcher Prouty, who was a real figure, who tells uh, Garrison about a very complex mechanism in the government called the military-industrial strategy and the feelings about John Kennedy from the military establishment. And the fourth story, is the events of that day in Dealey Plaza, which we researched uh, extensively, and we also managed to shoot in Dealey Plaza and reconstruct uh, so that the audience could visualize the angles and so forth. So there's really four different stories uh, that are blended into one. It's quite, some, quite an effort. All right, I think I'm next, hello. 
I'm Miss L. I'm the English teacher. Uh, I have so many questions. I'm so excited you're here. But I'm going to take one that segues off Carlin's question. Uh, you're known for having many ties and contacts in the in the Cuban community, and I was just curious since your last efforts uh, for Comandante in about 2003-2004 weren't um, well. Uh, known, maybe perhaps due to some sort of political backlash, so I'm curious, uh, are you going to try it again uh, to deal with that whole, hi, thank you, uh, Cuban, uh, American, you know, um, you know, kind of Cuban missing crisis, snapping is very, very distracting, making me even more nervous. Are you going to try again, is what I'm trying to ask with, <laughs> I'm so sorry, uh, trying to heal sort of some of the wounds between uh, Cuba and America political relations now that the Bushes are no longer in charge, maybe new administration, maybe new opinions on the matter? Well, it's a complex question. Uh, first of all, Obama has not come through. He's made the signals to South America, but unfortunately he has not carried through. Uh, the State Department remains, uh, the embargo remains, and the embargo is a, is a hostile action against Cuba has always been that. Uh, America had an aggressive stance towards Castro before Castro had an aggressive stance towards America. So it's an it's a ugly story and of course the Cuban exile community has distorted every single issue. Very right-wing conservative community and they were a significant factor in destroying uh, Comandante which is a relatively harmless film you can see on YouTube for free. Uh, it's, just, it's just me hanging out with a dictator, so to speak, a strong man, I don't call him a dictator. But he was, uh, Fidel is an amazing character, and I hung out with him, he gave me extraordinary access and we filmed. It's a very well, I think, very well edited, very well made documentary, and it lets him speak. I mean, it's not really ideological that way. And of course, I was criticized for not challenging him and attacking him. I, the interview would not have lasted if I'd been hostile, it had to be friendly. And that was done in that spirit. HBO agreed to make the film. They promoted it. We were, they were two weeks from uh, airing it, and I think they bowed to significant pressure. So many emails from so many Cubans could be sent so many times, and you get HBO was not, you know, folded and pulled the film off the air. I also think there was some pressure from the White House. But uh, after that, I went back. They said they gave me money to go back, and I made a second film called. Looking for Fidel, which is one hour, which was shown on HBO, which is me being very aggressive with Fidel and asking him some very tough questions. He answers them. You see the film. It's available. You make up your own mind. It doesn't have the breadth and the scope of Comandante. Now, I just finished a third film uh, last uh, August. I not even finished. I shot an interview with Fidel at the age of 84 in Havana. I saw him right before we shot Wall Street, which was, uh, he gave me uh, wonderful access. He's weaker physically, mentally very alert, no longer in charge. And uh, I saw him and had uh, the results of that will be coming up. Hopefully in America will get out there. Who knows, I mean, it's harmless, but I think that again, we're running into the problems of economic distribution in America. It's always that, you know, they always say it's economics, but they really don't want to. And, when it comes to Latin America, there's a blind spot. I have to say, I had the same problem with South of the Border, which is now going to be distributed by a small distributor. And I hope to get it out in America this year. That's the story of Chavez and the Venezuelans, but also told through the eyes of seven Latin American presidents who we, we really have ignored in America. So the Latin American issue is a, is a, is a deep and dark, we're in deep denial because we've invaded uh, Central America so many times. We, we've uh, bullied them, uh, and we treat them, we've treated Latin America like our backyard. Uh, to make a long story short, I, put, I did go back uh, to uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis is a crucial, crucial event in world history because it, we were on the edge of war, nuclear war, the planet was at stake. And we got right to that edge and Kennedy and Khrushchev called it off. Uh, this is a key event in history and we deal with it in the secret history of the United States because a lot of it is still unknown to the American people. So that's a great, it's a great story, but we, we're not going to let Cuba go because Cuba represents a Vietnam, it represents the, the heart of the problem. It's, in Cuba, in Cuba is Afghanistan, in Cuba is Iraq, in Cuba is, is Vietnam. It, it's, the, it's the boogeyman, it's the, uh, it's the dark shadow. It's 90 miles off uh, the coast of Miami and it's driving, 
It's driven not 10, 11, 10 or 11 American presidents nuts. It's so crazy because when you go down there and the Americans go there once in a while, they see it. It's so, it's not, they're not, they're not what they're supposed to be. They're not zombies about to attack our country as in one of our horror films. You know, this is what we see. We always create enemies. And we made enemies out of, we created enemies out of Cuba. In the same way that we call Chavez a demon. Uh, we have to grow up. Anyway, it's in secret history. I'm doing a third Castro and a Chavez movie. So I don't know, I'm, you know, I'm not, this is not my area of specialty. I never intended to do this, but I ended up getting dragged in. Oh. What do you think your best movie that you made was? My best movie? How do I know? I think uh, each one was its own product of its time, place. It's like a, it's like you. It's like a child, you know. I, I have three children. Each one has their flaws. Each one has their strengths. I love, uh, I love making them when I did them, and I did them to the best of my ability. Sometimes I did have to compromise for marketing purposes or time reasons. But uh, now with a DVD, you're able to go back and you can always make a longer version, extended version. For example, Alexander was rushed uh, in, ter in terms of distribution in 2004. Also, it was compromised to the degree that there was a lot of pressure to take out any homosexuality and, uh, and violence. And, I, and I, I compromised to some degree, but not the essence of the story. But then I went back in 2007, three years later, and I issued... I worked uh, very hard, to, and we made a DVD called Alexander Revisited, which is very the best version of the film. It's three hours and 45 minutes with an intermission, which is what it should have been. And it has the whole thing, and it's very clear to me now. You're back. <laughs> uh, you Selecting actors for a movie. Are you the <coughs> it's what? I'm sorry, can you put your mic up? Are you um, influenced by how famous they are? Huh. <laughs> no, I think uh, on the contrary, you want to avoid that problem. That's a trap. Uh, a, you need the money, apparently, to get a, a movie made of having stars, but you can fall into a trap of having the wrong star playing the wrong role in the movie and it's screwed from the beginning, so you'll never come over that. Get the right person to do the movie. And, Try to make him hopefully recognizable enough so that an audience will go to it. There being very few people in this new system that are single, single-handedly can do it. It's beyond uh, Brad Pitt or Will Smith and so forth. You, it's really a combination now. It's like how many? If you can get two or three that are not going to do it by themselves to combine in a way that create chemistry or excitement, that's better. You can also make a movie without actors or stars. You can just go with actors, and uh, you may get less money to make it in the system, but you can still make a good movie, a fine movie. So, uh, but sometimes you want somebody who's really likable to an audience because it helps uh, the movie. Uh, a movie is a movie. People have two, two and a half hours. They're not reading a book here. You know, they're, they're gonna, they want to see a face that they can identify with readily on the screen. If, without compromising your movie, it makes sense if, you, if it works. I like to take an actor who's known, but I like to twist it and give you another version of him. That gives me particular pleasure. But uh, I don't want to fall into the trap of working with movie stars. That would be a, it's a horrible experience. <laughs> it's a horrible experience because you have to deal with ego. And I really believe that uh, a movie's, a, the idea of a movie is the most, is the supreme deity on the set. And I think we all have to agree to a, that that is the most important thing. And when you have somebody who's obstructing that process, you're in trouble. Uh, okay, I've got one, uh, Mr. Stone. Um, <clears throat> the world economy has been rocked in the last, uh, in the last year, and uh, you've come back to, uh, to Wall Street uh, for a second movie. You had the character Gordon Gecko in the first one, uh, who gives a speech to an audience, and uh, he, uh, he starts and finishes by saying, greed is good. Um, how do you think that uh, that goes down in America <clears throat> these days with, uh, with the debt situation and, and all of those things? <laughs> There's a line in the new movie where he says, I, they say I said that greed is good back in the 1980s. I may have said it, I don't remember it, but now it seems it's legal. <laughs> well, I think that's very appropriate. Greed is now legal. I mean, it always was, but it really has been legalized by this new process by which 
the banks uh, and the bankers created, originally banks were serving society, it seems to me. That's, they were the, uh, one of the, Wall Street itself was an engine for capitalism. The banks made sound investments. They took less profit. And then in the 1980s, uh, especially in the 90s, what happened was that you had these individuals, uh, traders, uh, like Gecko, who became usually rich, uh, making money for themselves by scurrilous actions such as blackmail or greenmail, what they call greenmail, buying companies they were not interested in owning, stripping them of assets. There was all kinds of shenanigans to make money, which, I mean, when you get very smart people, and they're the smartest people I know in that, in that in money in the world, and they're all in this Wall Street area, and these guys, guys are brilliant. They, they know com computers, some of them are mathematical geniuses, you have uh, scientists, all kinds of uh, nerds and software experts, and they're really, they get it down to a science. This whole new computer science is, they don't even care the name of the company. They have a buy-sell program uh, which goes on all in huge volumes throughout the day, and they buy and sell for half a penny. And they, through volume and the size of the computer, they can make a profit that's significant. So at a certain point, it became about only making money. That was the Gordon Gecko era of 1980. So by 2000, I think the bankers felt a certain amount of envy, let's say by the 1990s, and I think that the banks themselves began to change their nature, and they became, instead of lending institutions for business and people, it became money makers unto themselves. So they created branches of new, new ways of making money by creating debt, what they call debt structures, or derivatives that would allow for them to make huge profits by trading not only for themselves, trading for their clients, and create these new mortgage bundles or, or whatever you, I don't want to confuse your audience, but there was all kinds of debt instruments that made no sense, nobody understood them. <laughs> and uh, it got crazy. I mean, and the, uh, they made, billion, all of a sudden billions of dollars became the, the formula. Whereas when I was in Wall Street, my father, a million dollars was a huge amount of money. A million dollars. When I went back in 2008, it was a billion dollars to get going. A billion dollars is insane. I mean, that's a thousand million dollars. But that, I think Wall Street represents the inflation of American society, the inflation of our defense budget, the inflation of our, of our government, the whole concept of bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. You know, Big Mac, we supersized ourselves to this place where the banks we're suddenly trying to compete with the hedge funders. The hedge funders making five million bucks, 10 million bucks, 40 million bucks. The bankers were now looking to make billions, and they did. And the banks were divorced from their meaning and trust. And when this thing came down, it was, it was clear uh, that this was a significant change in the system, that the banks were not existing for the benefit of society. They were existing for the benefit of themselves. And the bonuses that are being paid out are emblematic of that idea, that they're competitive with each other only. As a result, two or three of them failed, big ones. And what happened? The other ones absorbed them and became even bigger. So now we're faced with this problem of bigger and bigger banks. And they are leading the, the field, and they have to make money because they have stockholders, and we're a stockholder-ridden system. So we're in an endless cycle, and I think it's a very dangerous cycle. Uh, the banks, I do think, have to be re reformed, broken down, returned to some f basis of regulation, which is sane. I'm not an expert on how, but I do think that we're aiming, we're aiming for another major credit bubble if this continues. It was a serious heart attack in 2008, and that's why I made the movie, because I think it's a time to do it now. It got worse from, I didn't think it was going to get worse uh, from Gecko in 1987. I was shocked that it got bigger and bigger. But this was like a quadruple bypass, and I think that we're back eating and drinking, and I think it's uh, dangerous. I, I don't know where it's going to go, I'm no, and uh, everyone on Wall Street, no one knows. We're riding on a, on a wild roller coaster. The country is kind of partially insane because we're, our elections are a divisive process. There's a lot of partisanship, and now the Supreme Court, which is a right-wing uh, majority and, and stole the election of 2000 for Bush, has now voted to allow corporations to contribute any amount of money to uh, 
their candidates of their choice, or in that, for that matter, to go against the candidate of their choice, which will stymie any significant reform legislation, if necessary, to clean up these corporations. Corporations are not people. The Supreme Court came back and said, corporations are people. They have the rights of human beings. This is, this is not the case, and this is a violation of what America stood for, I think. So if corporations have the rights of people, we're all screwed. You and I have no chance against Exxon or any of these banks. Question in the back. Hi. Um, I got two questions for you. Two? That's not fair. <laughs> oh, you want one only? <laughs> I'll take a half. <laughs> well, I just want to know, like, how many films have you, like, made throughout your lifetime? And which one was the most challenging? Most what? Challenging. Uh, how many films I made as a director? About 20. And as a uh, writer, another six or seven separately. As a producer, I probably produced, I wasn't uh, overly active, but I had partnered in producing uh, about seven or eight good films, I thought. But uh, 20 directed, six written. Each one was a lot of work. Each one was challenging at the time in its own way. If you take the, all the physical values and the, the money and the issue of how many people are involved and all the, the this financial groups I had to deal with, probably Alexander was probably the biggest movie I did because it was 90 some days, 95 days, three continents, uh, it was Thailand, Morocco and England and it was independently financed. So it was quite some challenge. Uh, JFK was also a huge challenge in the sense of its structure. This idea I told about the four stories that were grafted. But every one of these films has been a, has been a tough one. Is that we have one question? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Peter? What were some of the things that influenced you in the writing of Scarface? What influenced me on Scarface was uh, 1981 Miami. I went down there <coughs> and I wanted to, to I, we did a lot of research and we hung out I don't want to tell you this because it's not good, but I was uh, involved, uh, I was under the influence of cocaine when I was younger, and it was very popular at that time. And uh, the interesting thing about that movie is that I, uh, I researched it knowing that world. I went, I went with the bad guys, you know, the, the, the drug dealers, and met them. I met the law enforcement people. And I met the new uh, drug enforcement agency, and, uh, and Florida itself is quite a story. I mean, it's such an exaggeration. The amount of money is what stunned me. Again, this was the or beginning of the 1980s, the go-go years with Ronald Reagan. All the, glove, the gloves were off. You could make as much as you wanted, but the money was beyond belief. The uh, young people that I saw that were making big money uh, was equal to the Wall Street kids that were making big money in the 80s. So it was a new ball game. And there was all kinds of new technologies to evade the law. It was a fascinating period. And uh, I tried to reflect that in Wall Street, in uh, Scarface, and also in the first Wall Street. Uh, they were very much 1980s films. But uh, then I got off Coke to do it. You see, I wrote the damn thing straight. And then went back to Coke. So it was my homage to Coke. I hated the goddamn drug so much. Because it, it's a money drain and it just kills you. It kills your brain cells that I stopped. Uh, I said, this is my farewell. And I wrote the damn script and I never went back to it. <laughs> we, have to, we have time for one or two more questions. Mr. Usha. <laughs> Hello again. Oh, no. <laughs> Many questions. I told you I have notes. Um, actually, I'm, I'm well. Because we'll I'm a language teacher, I'll ask a, a, one language question and another movie buff question. My language question is that um, information I have on you. You spent time in Europe. You went to Paris, as you said. Are you still fluent in French? Have you found that handy in your time, uh, both in Paris and then, of course, during your tour of duty in Vietnam? Uh, I, uh, my mom is French, and uh, I had the benefit of growing up and uh, spending a lot of time in the summers when I was young there, so I picked up the language, not from a book, but from people. So that's probably the best way, as a language teacher, I would say. But, you know, few people can do that. It's tough, but speaking it works. 
especially when you don't have anybody speaking English around you, that's the best way to learn it. You have to jump right in the water and you learn. But uh, it did, did it help me many times? It's, uh, it's a wonderful rhythm in the head. It's a different way of thinking, too. Sometimes I think, uh, when I was younger, I used to think in French. Uh, in, thinking in French means the words, the signals are all in French, you see. And I had problems in first grade and second grade in America because I was in school here, but I was having problems forming words. I still do, to some degree, some of the bigger words I pronounce wrong. But that's okay, that's my The issue is I like the rhythm, I like the way they think. The French have a very uh, thoughtful people. They, and it gives me a, a, a bifurcation that I like. I like to have that. Like you guys that are from America that are here, you're getting the benefit of, I think it's great for all students to live in different cultures, and I, I urge students to get out of their, get out of their environment uh, after they graduate and try to travel and see the world. It helped me specifically one time when I came up to Cambodia in 1965. We took the road up to Cambodia. We, there was a highway, and there was Vis uh, Viet Cong, Guerrillas all, and there were. Uh, I was. I had a beard. I was about uh, 19. I had a beard, and I was traveling with a Frenchman in a French car. We went through the uh, Viet Cong roadblock. We took paid a road tax, but they searched the car, looking for Americans. And uh, my beard and my French accent convinced them I was okay, and I made it up to Phnom Penh. I had a ball. Thank you. Um, my last question is for movie buffs. Cole's an avid or aspiring film person, and I'm just an avid movie junkie. Uh, you got to, when you were at NYU for film school, uh, it's been quoted that you had uh, a mentor, a teacher of Martin Scorsese, and I was just wondering, do you still keep in contact with him? What have you learned from him? And do you help him with the preservation of movies, which as a history teacher I also find really important that the younger generations, the new generations still get a chance to look at and, you know, maintain films past? No, uh, I don't, uh, I see Marty Scorsese here and there. He was a teacher, he was a wonderful teacher. He was a great teacher at NYU Film School. Uh, and he was a uh, young energy, but he, and he transferred that concepts, very important concepts of film to us, and he adored film, as you know. Uh, I have to say, in fairness, that there was many other good teachers at NYU, too, so, uh, but he was one of that vanguard. Uh, and then I see him through the years, here and there. Uh, he very much does his thing. Uh, I'm not part of a foundation. Uh, he's looking for, you know, he, he's really working at this uh, thing, and he, it's his thing. I mean, it's, it's, he, he makes it his, and he's got his own people around him, and, and so on. Uh, but certainly I wish him well, you know, and uh, he wishes me well. One more question in the back. I can. <laughs> I can speak, but I can't be there. I can go down to the local market and buy one of your films for two dollars. Uh, you're probably aware of this. Obviously, no one in this room would ever do that. Um, do you think there would be some reason for reorganizing the way films are distributed in the West, saying if someone here is making profit for two dollars, why would it cost ten times that price to sell the same DVD somewhere in Europe, for example? Well, you know, it's the piracy question. You're back to that. I mean, we have to live with piracy in every business. Uh, there's a, you make clothes, they're going to rip off clothes. We can't work at these prices. It's just not possible. A film is going to cost money if you're going to live in the Western standard. And you cannot make these things in a way that people want to see them. I mean, there is a certain factor called glamour or whatever it is, well, size, spectac spectacle, costs money. Uh, people are kidding themselves if they think they're going to get the same thing on the internet. Or, frankly, I don't go for, uh, you know, the concept of interruption. I mean, I think uh, what Avatar is one of those type of movies that reminds people of why we go to a theater. And I have to say this, because the media went after the movie business heavily, always, but they've always criticized movies. It's easy to criticize, it's hard to do. But they said that movies were over repeatedly in the last five, ten years, and uh, it's encouraging to see that last year in the United States was the largest domestic box office of all time, and the screens actually got better. There was a time when the screens were getting worse, the movie theaters were falling off. People are building movie theaters, making them better, outfitting them with better sound, 3D, IMAX, and people are coming in droves because they would like to have an experience outside the home. They don't want to stay home all day, and thus some kids do, but that's, I think they will change as they grow up. 
you can look at the computer and be isolated all you want, but I don't want to see a movie on a computer unless it's a movie I really don't want to see in a theater. And that, you know, then I wouldn't go to the theater anyway. So there's too many movies. Most of them are not worth going to a theater, but with those movies that I want to see in a theater, I want to see in a theater. Because I love the collective experience. And as, we, as we're sitting here in a classroom, there's something happening, hopefully, a chemistry, as opposed to my being on a screen, talking singly to, to one person. There is a collective, as, as it is in theater. This is what catharsis is, this is what drama is. Thank you, uh, Mr. Stein. Thank you. teacher up for a photograph, I guess that's we'd like to do that. Uh, we will be extending uh, lunch until uh, 12.30 today. Uh, but uh, you don't need to run out quite yet. Uh, so let's uh, appreciate this. Uh, <laughs>